physics. No, workbook physics. Uh, 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 Theos Kulo. So much for my plan of starting the experiments in class when more people are here. Uh, it's not working this morning. When's our next class? Morning or afternoon? I'll just have to start with whoever's there. I can't can't wait any more than this week. Okay, Coulomb's law. Right, so you, you might remember that a point charge produces an electric field. So let's actually look at that a little bit more. So, for example, here's a charge, let's say it's Q1, and here's a charge, let's say it's Q2. And just imagine you're the Q1 for the moment. Uh, and let's just keep it easy. Let's just say this is positive and this is negative. So there will be a force pulling you to the right here. Okay. Um, there's a field around the negative. I'd like to calculate what that force is. Well, it's going to be equal to QE using that electric field formula, QE. So that's um, Q1E. <coughs> now, what is the formula for E? Well, you might remember the formula for E is 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. And in this case, the Q2 is causing the field. So that's Q2. And the distance, we'll call the distance R squared between them. So actually, you can simplify this formula down into 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 Q1, Q2 over R squared. And in fact, some people just call this constant, because it's just a constant, they would call that just K, capital K. K, Q1, Q2 over R squared. This is actually, it doesn't matter if you use K, um, this is Coulomb's law. Now let me just tell you, in the formula book in the exam, okay, they provide you with this K in the formula book. However, this K is not on your calculator. So if you wanted to use the constant on your calculator, you need to type it in like this. So this is good if you're using your calculator, and this is good if you're using the formula book. Yeah, in the formula book. So uh, maybe it's just easier to use this. Okay. Um, this is Coulomb's law. I wonder if I actually write that down here. Yeah, Coulomb's law states F equals K, Q1, Q2 over R squared, where F is the force between the charges, R is the distance. And I actually have the value of K here. Uh, so I think it's enough just to write this box down, please. So this is Coulomb's force, Coulomb's law. 
This is the force that keeps, you know, your protons and your electrons in orbit. Oh, good grief. I'm going to starve. I'm going to faint. I'm going to be taken to hospital. Uh, okay. Got that? Yep. Continue, so. <coughs> so, uh, let's have a look here at Coulomb's law for this example. The proton and the electron. Proton? Electron. According to Coulomb, there's a force here. And that force is equal to K, Q1, Q2 over R squared. But also according to Coulomb, there's a force this way too. And that force is equal to K, Q2, Q1 over R squared. But they're the same. They're the same force. Because it's the same formula. But then why does the electron move around the proton? Why couldn't it be the other way around if the force is the same? So what's different? What is making the electron move around the proton and not the other way around? It's the charge. These are the same charge. So it can't be the charge then. It has to be something else. It's huh? It's yeah, it's the mass that's different. So because the mass is different, even though the force is the same, the mass is different. So usually what happens is, because this mass is much bigger than this mass, we imagine that this is not moving and it's just the electron <coughs> moving around it. But actually in real life, because there's a force here, this actually does move. It kind of, uh, kind of wobbles a little bit. Yeah. So, uh, okay. So we often actually don't care about the proton in these pictures. We just look at the electron. Right. When one charge, Q, is trapped in a circular orbit by another charge, big Q, we'll say, then it will have a negative potential energy. So, you know this from chemistry, this electron is trapped. Remember we said if something is trapped, its potential energy is negative. In fact, you know the name of this energy in chemistry. What do you call the energy the electron needs to be free? Not this one, no. Or maybe I should phrase that differently. What type of energy is used to free the electron? What's the adjective? Ionization energy? Ionization energy? Yeah. Yeah? No? So ionization energy is the energy the electron needs to be freed, to ionize, to free an electron. You look shocked. Is it okay, Matt? Or is this a new word for you? No. Anyways, because the electron has a negative potential energy, it's trapped and it needs energy to be freed. So, uh, I actually, you have a formula for calculating this potential energy. It's negative KQQ over uh, or no square. So the reason for the minus is because it's trapped. And it's a small charge trapped by a bigger charge, perhaps. Oh, so big K as well, yeah. The same K. Ah, it doesn't matter. You can call it Q1, Q2. I'm just trying to emphasize that it's usually a small charge trapped by a big charge. Okay, continue? Yep. So, by the way, this only works if um, one of them is positive and one of them is negative because if they were both positive, then they're not trapped, they're being pushed away. So perhaps you might also want to write down um, that these are opposite in signs, like a positive and a negative one, or something like that. 
Okay. Continue. Coulomb's law gives the size of force between two charges. This force is one of the four basic forces of nature. So in nature, there's four forces. Uh, we've seen one already, gravity. That's one of the forces of nature. The next one is this force we're doing now, Coulomb's, the force between charges. It's the second force. Uh, does anyone know the other two? I see, because we haven't talked about them yet. So we have um, gravity. This one's called electrostatic, or Coulomb's. Strong nuclear and weak nuclear. They're the four forces in nature. But we'll talk about those in a more time. What's interesting about Coulomb's law is an example of an inverse square law in physics. And these are actually pretty common in physics. And it's worth actually thinking why. So Coulomb's law is like this. K, Q1, Q2 over R squared. So it's something equals something over distance squared. And what I'm saying is, it's actually quite common in physics to have formulas that look like this, where you have a distance squared in the denominator. It's actually pretty common. And there's a reason for that. Can I scroll down a little bit just to explain? So let's say you're studying something. Doesn't matter what. The example I always use as a joke is uh, you're looking at how smelly someone is. So let's say we have a unit of smelliness. Let's call it, um, what could we call it? Nose units or something. So um, this person is releasing 10, let's say, nose units. Okay? And we want to calculate how strong is the smell over here a distance or away. How strong is that smell uh, here? Uh, what's the smell equal to here? So obviously it should be less, right? So can you imagine like big spheres that are expanding out around the person? When the sphere gets here, it's pretty big. At each slice, the smell is getting spread out over a bigger distance. So let's say this is 10 nose units per second. Okay? And this is one second passing. This 10 units is getting spread out over a bigger area. So the strength of the smell here will be 10 divided by the area because it's 10 at the beginning here. Uh, what's the area for a sphere? The area for a sphere is 4 pi r squared. So the reason the R squared appears in these formulas is because we imagine the strength gets smaller because it's being spread over a bigger sphere until it reaches you. Okay? So you don't need to know this for the exam. I just wanted to talk about why these inverse square laws are so common in physics. Because the way something dissipates as it moves through space is, uh, is because it's being spread over a bigger sphere. Okay. It's not really something for the exam. Uh, okay. Oh, also, it's worth noting that K is very large. Uh, what was it? 8.99 times 10 to 9. That's actually important. That will come up later. Okay. Here is a calculation for you to do. You have a proton, you have an electron, and they're 0 0.1 nanometers apart. I want the force, please, using Coulomb's formula. So using that formula, calculate the force for me. I'll put my calculator. <coughs> right. I'll let you try before I give you the answer. I think you can do this.
Oh, sorry. Great, let's calculate. So what was the K? 8.99 times 10 to the power of 9, wasn't it? Yeah? Um, and then the charges of the proton and electron are both E, and the distance is zero, 0 0.1 nanometers. So did you get this answer? Did you get this? Oh. The e has yeah. to be no, I gave you the constant. It's the charge of a proton and the uh, electron. They're both equal to E. So, it's like this if you prefer. Is that okay? Matt, continue. Yes, no, maybe so? Yes. Yeah? Okay. Right. Now, here's a juicy one. How long does it take an electron to orbit a proton, which is orbiting in a circle of radius 2 nanometers? So we'll do this one together. This is the picture. The heck? One. Proton. Electron, distance 0.2 nanometers, and I want to calculate the time. Now, um, what type of motion is this? Circular motion, yeah? So you can say F equals m omega squared or. So then that means omega is f over m or square root. Is that okay so far? Now, do you remember the formula for t? t is 2 pi over omega. So that would be 2 pi root m or over f. But we have a formula for f. We can use Coulomb's formula. So that's m or over k q1 q2 over or squared. Right, let's clean that up a little bit. That's 2 pi root m or cubed over k q1 q2. So I've worked out a formula for getting t. Yeah? Let's calculate it. 2 pi root, uh, what's the mass number of electron? It's number 3 for the electron mass, yeah. Times the radius cubed over k times the charges. Okay, so if you put all the numbers in on the calculator, you get this time. Is that okay, Matt? Under? Matt? 
I can continue? Okay. Right, so the next one, I'll let you calculate as well. Using the formula for potential energy, how much potential energy does an electron have if it's orbiting a proton at this distance? Big crowd. Okay, got an answer? Let's have a look. Um, so that would be K times this Q1, Q2 over the distance. No square. Now look, because this is so small, what is a better unit to use instead of joules? Do you remember the other unit we can use when it's really, really small? We could use electron volts. So we divide by E to convert it into electron volts. So the, so the answer is minus 9.6 electron volts. That's the potential energy. Minus 9.6 electron volts. Continue? Yeah? I can't, what are you saying, Matt? Oh, wait, okay, yeah. This one, did I mistype? Oh my goodness. Checking that. What you checking? Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Got that? Continue? So, um, there's about 10 or 15 minutes left. Um, just the one lesson today. The other students have already missed a lot because we did three tutorials. 
And our next class is Friday. Oh, how was the exam prep? Yeah, um, you got it over. Yeah, yeah, how was it? It was okay. We get, I think it's easier if we get booklet like this, so you don't have to go back. Yeah. yeah. How much did you get done in class? So yesterday we just did one quick one. Yeah. Did you check your answers yet? We didn't finish checking, but we didn't check some. Yeah. Um, when you were working in class, did you work together or by yourself? Both. You did a bit of both? Yeah. Okay, that's good. Yeah, it'd be really, really good. The, the more you can practice from that book, the better. Yeah. So, Connell did mechanics yesterday. So, next week he'll give you some time to practice uh, materials. So it's really up to you to practice some from the book in your free time. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, so for about 10 minutes, a little bit more maybe, can you try your homework there, Coulomb's Law?